So good morning and good evening. Welcome to the Circle of Harmony and there's no topic except we'll just reflect on some things and reflect on the word harmony. That was basically what was intended but very flexible. So before we begin and since we are meeting after such a long time especially just although it's not related, just in gathering ourselves, just taking a few seconds to be fully here. Thanking Grace, thanking Divine that I have the ability to be fully here, if I choose to be fully here. And aspiring that may I choose to be in the present, in the fact, more and more and more. Thank you. So I thought I would even be saying welcome to the circle of harmony in my dreams but nothing of that sort happened. So it was quite miraculous how you feel something is you know a part of your life or your life and you know part like it's a habit and then it's the next day it's like it's absent and still everything is just as it is so so much to be grateful for. So um, before we begin on the topic of harmony and, you know, one quote that I had shared before that, I would like to ask because I don't know, because for me, I think it was a very living thing. The last topic where we left, we had not even completed it. We left it somewhere hanging, although not hanging, just reflecting, you know, the complaint free world where we had was the last thing we were discussing. So for me, it was a very living thing. Like it just kept sticking, just kept poking, just kept knocking and just kept showing me whatever I was ready to see and there would be so much more. So just opening this out, I mean, again, just reminding that, you know, this is not a one-way street. Please do share if you have felt anything. Nothing is trivial. Everything is beautiful and really helps all of us. So if the topic revealed anything to you, if you were able to continue with it or look at it or hold it, was anything shown, was anything visible, any changes we have made in our life? I'll take that as a no or should I give one minute and not run through it? Okay. Yeah, sir, I will share. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, we were living in India for so long and in between my husband got a job in Singapore. So, we had to move to Singapore. First, we didn't like Singapore because we are so used to having helpers and uh, you know, going uh, out by car and, you know, generally, in Tamil we say Sukhavasi. We will not do anything. So everything will be done for us. You know, even vegetables you will get at your doorstep. And everything was so comfortable. So my husband always says, if something is very comfortable, then we should break it. We should not be too comfortable. Then only we will learn. So th then only we'll have some growth. So in that point, by her mother's grace, we got, uh, you know, to shift to Singapore. So every day uh, and every Saturday, we used to go to the center, Sherbindo Society Center. And we used to do service and, uh, you know, we'll have satsang, reading, savitri, this, that and all. But every time, each time I go there, I will sit in front of the mother and I will fight with her. Mother, why, why have you moved us from Hyderabad? Because we are so, you know, we were so happy. We were so comfortable. 
and meera's uh, school you know it was she was very comfortable and everything was excellent but why did you do that every day i will ask her every time if i go there i will ask her but i feel like she is smiling at me so i'll come back and i'll tell my husband she he will laugh you ask but the answer will be different she will give in you know practical experience she will give you that is what she used to say but you know after 2 years maybe for 2 3 months i have been asking after that the question disappeared from my you know brain i i was never asking and i started liking that place i started liking doing things on my own then i felt you know i have become more efficient i can manage everything so the type of confidence which came and uh, you know we were more involved in society's works for any cultural or uh, um, you know savitri reading or synthesis of yoga reading everything so we became one with the center we became one with singapore but after two years uh, you know because of you know my ma- father in law passed away my mother in law was left alone we had to shift back to india so that time i went and sat in front of her i felt the same smile from the mother and from singapore only i started writing you know stories and small stories for the newsletter some experience till such time i have never touched my pen to write something like this i never uh, imagined you know this this could happen but you know i could see the you know same loving compassionate smile from the mother and we said mother it's okay anyway you have for this experience we have come here now this is over we'll go back to india so after coming back to india even now i feel you know see that time it felt very uncomfortable for me i felt that th- that was not fair so why do why should we go and we didn't have our pr that time at after coming back to india we got our pr <laughs> so i was telling the mother maybe this is also your play so don't get too attached to anything just be so that was a beautiful uh, um, experience for me and one more very very small i would i'm sorry i'm taking a bit more time but i will share see my elder brother he was you know uh, not well during covid time and almost you know we have a doctors given up you know he everybody said he will not survive and everybody you know we were crying because you know, my eldest brother passed away uh, a month back and this this person also got a, his covid so we were not very you know we were really confused and we didn't know what to do but it was very uncomfortable situation when the doctor said he will not survive i don't know suddenly i felt very happy so same thing i went sat in front of the mother i was asking her mother what is the meaning of this why am i feeling happy actually i should be uncomfortable i was uncomfortable but i started feeling very comfortable because he had a very bad uh, you know uh, living so anyway there should, there cannot be any end for this some thought came this is the best best thing happening to him so let him go to the mother's feet so with that the same evening he also left but i couldn't even cry you know one drop of water didn't come out i felt i was thanking the mother mother thank you you have taken him but everyone was you know looking at me what is this lady doing without it has both the brothers are not there this lady is acting like you know crazy but i felt very comfortable it's okay all his suffering has come to an end why should i bother now he is at mother's feet now so there is a meaning in what she does so that is what came to me hello hi How are you? Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, good. Good to see everybody together again. Yeah. 
thank yeah. you so, so much yeah <laughs> thank you tarun Yeah. Hi, Ritu. Good to see you. Was not expecting. Yeah. Hi. You. Yeah. No, I thought since we are meeting after such a long time, gonna be nice. Yeah. So Ritu is going for her Vipassana retreat, four a.m. tomorrow morning, and she is yet to pack. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Ritu, we were just kind of very briefly touching upon the last week's, not last week's, the last topic that we had, you know, spoken on, on the complaint-free world. And we were wondering if we saw anything, you know, during this time that showed us that, oh, here we are going wrong or, you know, any learning. So that's what Charuji was sharing. And, you know, it's so nice that a lot of times the right movements appear crazy you know how you know you said that people thought about oh, this woman is crazy and stuff like and they actually feel that maybe they are in shock or there's some trauma or they are going through you know any phase and it will pass and then you will break down and yet when that thing comes from this assurance that yes i know like you were sharing that it he's gone to a better place or his suffering has ended and if it's not superficial, if it's a true knowing, there is no breaking, right? Because it's not a band-aid that came off. It's actually that you saw something which you were unable to see. Yes, please. Yeah. One more thing. You know, we perform shraad no, for the people who left us. So my both the brothers are not there. So my parents' shraad cannot be done. As our uh, this one says... Girls cannot perform any shard for parents. And just now, a week back, my eldest brother's shard was done by my another cousin. But nobody is doing for my elder brother. So my sister was feeling very bad. See, on that person, when he lived, he didn't have good food and good life. After his passing also, he didn't. he's not having anything. Then I, I told her, so many saints are not given anything after they have gone to the, you know, the mother's feet, the divine's feet. So you don't have to do anything for him. He is already comfortable. Then my sis sister looked at me like this. What are you saying? I said, yes, this is how I always feel. Even our parents, they don't need anything. They were already, they have reached the mother's feet. So after they are attained, you know, that beautiful place, then why should we bother? We'll just see them in their photographs. We'll just keep smiling and walking. So that that you know, place was very uncomfortable when I when I said to my sister. But I really feel that he he doesn't need anything. Yeah. Then she was also comfortable. Yeah. Yes, as you rightly said, so many saints are not given anything after their <laughs> passing. So our brother is a saint, we'll feel and we'll feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. You know, your Singapore example with so many times the word comfortable and so much we do or don't do because and so much of our complaining, you know, the word comfortable is so tied up to the word, the complaint because it's mostly whenever the comfort factor in me is poked. Then I lash out, I cry out, I scowl, I frown, I complain that, oh man, I have to do this or that. So yeah, very nice. So uh, if there is nothing, we can move to the code that we had wanted to discuss. But if there's anything, please mute and unmute, sorry. So I am hoping we can see the screen and the quote is, if the truth shall kill them, let them die. So 
very very strong very you know on our face and once when the, when i read it for the first time yesterday i was like what is he saying like has he gone crazy kind of and then suddenly i did feel very liberated you know it felt maybe not right but it felt very light that as if some space has been touched within me which hasn't been touched before or maybe there are certain things that i'm trying to save that do that you know it doesn't need saving so what are we afraid of and i don't know somehow the vision of you know the kurukshetra came to me with this quote that you know how krishna you know he just told arjun that kill right like for dharm for dharm for dharm what is dharm if not truth right so anything is okay if it is for the truth so here the thing is first should i do i know the truth like is it just my bells and whistles and whims and fancies and comfort factor or is it the truth so that is something i think that maybe weakens our resolve but yeah more so please if and i would request everybody if possible just so that we can hear what the thought process is what the person is thinking that if when we see this when we saw this or if i see it right now what is it that comes to me just you know a informal sharing without any pressure so i'll take names but i don't want to so anybody who's ready can please begin i i i may share do you hear me Yes, thank you. Yes, can hear. Okay. Well, of course, there, there is a lot of meanings we, we can take from here. Uh, as you say, truth is a, is a great word. It, it may mean many things, but the, 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 the first thing I get from this is that it reminds me of Krishnamurti saying something like, uh, you you really have to be willing to know the truth if you if you want to advance let's say in the path like uh, and of course my mother always says this like sincerity is probably the the first and the most important quality one one can have because we are full of insincerities and we have to be willing to to be very sincere in our in our quest. So the the first thing that comes to me from this quote is is that it's like we we have to be willing to accept to the truth to 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 be willing to to know and and to take the risks and i'm sure the truth cannot kill anyone it won't kill it won't kill you the the true truth but probably many things have to be sacrificed for that or or many things will die in some way like a lot of illusions and, and things that we are attached to. So what comes to me is we, we have to allow many things to die in ourselves, many things to, we have to take that risk to, to be willing to know the truth and live with it and and don't matter about the consequences for our ego, for our illusions. Yes, thank you, Mohan. You did, you know, when you say there will have to be a lot of sacrifices, I think that is quite the main thing. And what you know nobody would actually die but you know the the fear or the hurt sometimes you know the 
and especially when other people are involved, right? You feel that you might just hurt them so much and it could be beyond repair. And somehow, like I had discovered, I have I've discovered this recently that when I talk about faith, surprisingly, you know, I have faith in me and I have faith for me. But when it comes to others, I was like, you know, but I must do this for them because, you know, otherwise what would happen or they might not be able to do it or wear it. And I realized that I lack faith for others, right? That if I am taken care of, of course, the other is taken care of as well. And yet it was a harder thing to do. To have faith in myself for myself was easier. And I didn't realize those were different things. And yet I see myself doing some things, a lot of things, not because I want them, but just because how would it be managed without it and which is like such a fallacy. So good realization. Yes, Mon. Yes, yes, I get it. Uh, and also in, in that more um, daily meaning, I also found that many times uh, I think one one can be compassionate and truthful at the same time, and, and we, we should try to be always. But I have found that many many times I, I have shrink from telling maybe some truth that uh, could be hurtful. And, hard to swallow for, for for another person or a loved one. Uh, and in my experience, I, I think um, in the end, more trouble comes from, from not being truthful and more hurt, um, more pain comes from, from avoiding this, this truth that anyway, it, it can be rendered and, and told in a in a compassionate and careful way yes i agree so i think one point again that came to me while you were sharing was that what is this what would what good would this telling do right sometimes like we take honesty to be like so flat that even if it's irrelevant, we might make some point because, you know, we heard that you must tell the truth. But if telling the truth is, I don't know, saving me or saving someone, then it makes sense, right? You Because we could just be stating some useless facts, which could be true. And yet it doesn't help anybody. So that discretion also needs to be made that what good is it doing or is it doing any harm? Yes, so, yeah, who goes next? My God. Yeah, I'll talk. So, um, you know, when I read that, that uh, quote quotation you sent, I had this urge to reply in the group that oh this is this is so good like this is so nice and you know experience like if i have to share an experience i will say truth you know it definitely hurts me especially you know especially that phase of accept accepting it and moving on with it it hurts, but the end, you know, after that phase is all of, is all bliss. There's nothing, I, I'm, I'm fully unattached with whatever, uh, you know, has happened after the truth. And, and which is why I wanted to respond in the group. But then I, I remembered um, my mother had a younger brother and, you know, he uh, passed away many years ago in a fire accident. So his child was in his uh, second grade. I think he was like, I don't know, like six, five, six year old. 
and someone in the family and you know they are very very soft with the, with the kids unlike my parents so someone in the family they just very politely just told him that you know um, your father has gone has has been taken away by the god because he was he's so good so god chose him first and god took him away and this kid i, I don't know he, i think he lost his consciousness and he stopped eating for uh, i don't know for many day, many many days and uh, everybody got scared so they ended up saying that then his mother uh, uh she 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 told him that um you know no he he didn't die or anything he will come back eventually but he's gone for a project that's what she told him and then up until i think he turned 15 until 15 years old he was still being convinced that his father is going to come and i think after 15 he was you know told the truth but by that time what she did is she developed him in a way that he is like he he no longer like he's more supported by himself versus being supported by even his mother or even his father he's become independent to that extent so she was building him while lying to him and when he said when she built him that's when she revealed it and it took him again it took him one two years he got very quiet we we are we were best friends and we didn't talk for two years straight uh, although we lived like what uh, two kilometers away in the same city so after that he recovered but the way he recovered is again mind blowing to me so so i don't want to uh, you know give any context on this because i don't know he had to lie to build his and and to prepare him and then when he was prepared she told him the truth so now how can i say that truth at once is uh, good like I, i i this is actually a question i don't really know an answer for this Yes, thank you, Jagan. And I think that's why what uh, you know Juan had just said, what we were reflecting on, that what good is it doing, right? Like, is it doing any good? Because we might, you know, start a revolution, a uh, revolution, but for what cause, right? So I think it's something like that 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 cannot be left. And yet, you know, say for example, like you said. it depends on how ready somebody is that you know a buddha he saw somebody sick he saw somebody old he saw somebody being lit on the pyre and he was like my god so much suffering i i don't want it you know how do i rise above it and that truth led him towards his enlightenment so we really don't know what would lead to what and yet you are right and that's why this quote kind of really called on to a lot of us because it was like what is right right like because in our life we are always told to be cautious to be careful to be mindful to be courteous to be pleasing to be to cover up right so that everything looks good and watch what you are saying what what you are doing don't hurt anybody be compassionate and somehow if it feels that it would hurt or it has a potential of you know nearly killing someone we would not be able to do it and we will find that selfish we would find that unacceptable and yeah so it does raise a lot of questions and it's great at times not to have answers right away and just see what is where we are being led by something yeah deepa you had unmuted if you would like to yeah i mean there are two aspects that i would like to talk about um one is referring to of course jagan's story and with that in context um what is truth right is the first question for me and if we think about truth um for taru and me the truth is today it is right now morning for somebody in india it is evening and if somebody from india says no that's wrong that's not the truth it is evening and if i say no it's morning you're you're lying 
So what is truth in this context, right? Because we see truth differently. Your truth could be different from my truth. And that is why I think it is said that the ultimate truth is your truth. It is not somebody else's truth, but what you perceive as true without being dishonest to yourself is the ultimate truth. And taking this into context, if we talk about the universal consciousness in which every living being is part of and this consciousness being within us and it is part of our being, then that itself is the ultimate truth, meaning that we are all united, we are all one and and when we are being dishonest to somebody else, we are being dishonest to ourselves. And for that reason, truth is important. So that's one aspect. And taking that into context with Jagan's story, I think the the truth was that the lady's husband died. That that was her truth. The child was too young to understand that truth. And that was probably what the elders realized at that point, that he wasn't ready to absorb the truth, did not get the meaning of the truth, or his world collapsed with that truth, right? So this is where I think one's compassion comes into play. Ki sometimes we end up saying or avoiding the truth because it doesn't seem compassionate enough. Um, so the truth at that time for the child was to be not exposed to it probably, to give him time to accept that truth. And these are all our realities, I guess. So there's no straightforward answer to it. Um, coming to the second aspect of truth, uh, I feel at times, especially when you're in an argument or in a fight, um, I've seen that things that I never um, told a friend or a, a or a sister or a relative because I thought it seems very unkind to expose, you know, certain aspects of her personality that seems very uh, abhorrent to me. Um, I wouldn't say, but if when it becomes a fight, then all the truth comes out spilling. And why does it come out at that time spilling is is the intention behind it, right? The intention is to hurt somebody when you're talking that truth. And it's happened a lot of times with me. Ki at some point when it is comfortable, I don't want to share the truth because I don't want to hurt the person. But the day the truth comes out is the day I want to hurt the person. So, so I think also the intention behind the truth is very important. I can't, I can't uh, justify my action saying that, oh, she needed to know the truth because I'm not being honest and true to myself. My intention was wrong. Um, so I think understanding these two aspects of truth is very important to me, but I don't know if there's something beyond that I'm not able to see. And uh, yeah, I'm open to reflection. Yes, thank you. So ultimate truth or absolute truth is usually, you know, considered truth that, you know, truth by definition is something that doesn't change with time. It doesn't change by location, circumstances, time, person, which is always true, always in every situation. And also, I think ours are just relative truths or rather perceptions, right? Our likings, our ideas of rights and wrongs. And they say that because you cannot touch the truth directly being who you are. So just follow your inner calling, right? Follow your inner voice. Follow that thing which is telling you right from wrong. But knowing that everything that I follow has its limits, right? And yet I will have to be true. I should be, not have to. I should be true to myself, you know, because when you said that I'm being dishonest to the other, I'm being dishonest to myself. And the same thing, you know, while reflecting on harmony, I realized that a lot of times I do things for outside harmony, right? Of a person, of a situation, of a relationship, of a family. And it feels good that, okay, you know, everything is harmonious. But in doing that, my inner harmony has no place. Like I had to really do things which I didn't want to do. And yet I said, okay, for the greater good. And that if I would hear anybody else do it, I would say, no, please don't do that to yourself. And yet when it came to me, I would do that because 
in the name of harmony or compassion or whatever and maybe it's time to call out that you know call that out and say no more you know kind because somewhere somebody will have to be heard for the truth for the truth as you see it so yeah Yeah, Ritu, you might have to leave. Do you want to uh, share before you go? I don't know what your time constraints are today. I don't even know whether you can unmute. So, okay. Yeah. Actually, I think it's very relative truth. So, in some contexts, it feels that truth should be told but in some context like when Jagan mentioned it seems that it's um, better than truth to be not uh, sharing it with the child right now so sometimes you know um, but like let's say if somebody is very old and he is probably not going to live for long so telling that person that okay you're going to be dying in two months whether it's good to tell that truth or not, so that's also a little confusing. I think like all situations, in some places, it might be good not to be truthful. Hmm. But even when I'm not being truthful, I am being truthful to myself. It's just that in the outer definition, I am not being truthful. I think here what you are saying is ki, see what you are talk, talking as truth, say what Jagan said or what Sadeepa touched upon, what you are saying that somebody is dying, you tell them or not. I think these are just facts of existence, right? Like, okay, this is happening right now. And what good would it do? Right? Like, is, is, will there be some benefit out of telling or not telling or whatever, right? And yet, what you said, you know, what you ended with right now is as long as I am truth, truth, truthful to myself, right? But a lot of times, and I think this is the main thing, at least right now for me, is that we are not truthful to ourselves or we are crushing or pulling or stretching ourselves for the sake of not hurting or not rocking the boat that we, you know, this is one of the things we commonly use. So what you are saying that, okay, of course, if you know, and it's okay if the other doesn't, and as long as you're fine, then I think there's absolutely no issue. We won't even be, you know, pulled towards this code then, kind of. But the issue only arises when we feel that, you know, we are trying to not tell the truth because it would hurt, it would hurt, it would hurt, and how would the person take it, for example? Mm -hmm. Because it obviously a lot of times, you know, where we are, it has achieved some level of harmony, right? Superficial harmony. And it seems that everything is in order. But one thing, you know, you could share, you could say, and that would, I don't know, this that confrontation, that truth could break the whole thing. So... That's what we are scared of. So here I think it's mostly for me, it was like, do not be scared of that, right? Like if something has to be resolved, like for example, say uh, uh, when we were fighting for independence, right? Like say a freedom fighter could say that, you know, everything is going fine, right? Like the British is ruling India, everything seems to be in harmony. Yes, we have a few disadvantages. We don't have those jobs, but we, there are so many advantages, the railway system, the postage system, you know, they have done so That's much advancement. Awesome. Let me not rock the boat. But how would you be anything more than where you are, say the Sati movement was so widely accepted in India and a Britisher actually, a British person along with some Indian, free, you know, again, revolutionaries, he started opposing it very strongly that this is unacceptable. What are you guys doing? And yet when he stopped those people, he was looked upon as an enemy who was, you know, trying to stop what was culturally right, believed to be right. 
So I think just acknowledging that if I have to break certain things or confront or cause chaos for ultimate peace, as I see it, right? Because my obviously vision would be limited and it would be personal. That maybe it's time or maybe it's okay to go there. That was something that, yeah. I uh, interrupted you. I don't know if even if you were done. So no, I was. I was done. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I know Charuji wanted to share a story on this. I don't know if she, she can unmute right now. And Nandini is left. Nandini, would you like to go next? Anything you want to say on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think of truth in India, we say Ram Nam Satya hai. That means the only thing that is true is the divine or the Ram. And like, especially they say it in, when you are in the time of death and when they're taking the body because, you know, they, they, we believe that that the only thing that you can hold on to is that and this death is a, or losing a loved one is an opportunity to kind of redwell on this absolute truth, which is the divine. And, you know, when, of course, you're talking about this quote, but you, I, I feel really like for me, I've always felt that although the relative truth of our lives and quests keep can keep changing but one thing that that cannot change is really that that the tr only truth in life is our union with the divine in any form that you believe it and it's not only my truth it's everyone's truth even flower even when i look at the flower i remember i was listening to Eckhart Tolle's talk and he was talking about that even if you look at the flower that the how it blossoms, it blossoms you will actually see it as an attempt of enlightenment you know even in every form you can see that so for me uh, you know i've always felt that that you know th that's the only truth i can keep keep getting lost in stories this and that and this and that and you know can read different things and everything like that but actually till the time my inner being will actually realize in the mind and everything will realize that the only truth is that and i have to really situate every action every feeling every sensation towards that all other relative truths will fall in place. That's something I, I, I came to my mind. Another thing was that also, I feel that for me, it has also been, you know, especially in relation that revealing my inner truth and how does it have an effect on the other. Um, for me, it has been very, um, it has always changed because, you know, I, I, during my teenage and when I was young, I, I feel that I always, I was very, um, uh, how to say, people, I remember my relatives used to call that I'm very stubborn and I'm very, um, I used to re keep revolting everything and I never believed in this and that. I didn't like cooking and I used to feel it's, you know, men are really taking over the world and all of that and I did, you know, all of that. Anyways, <laughs> and I was somebody who never felt never lost, lost an opportunity of showing my truth in order to kill anybody who's trying to impose things on me. So I, I exactly know how it feels. But I think off late, I have felt that maybe for me, and you know, it's everyone's different journey. I feel it has taken a different turn. So I have to really go beyond my rag dwesh, my likes and dislikes, you know, what my inner being is telling me was vis-a-vis you know, in my human relationships, what expectations am coming out of me. Sometimes I feel it's a good practice for me to practice equanimity. So even if my inner being is telling me, okay, you know, I have to go gym now, or, you know, I have to actually go and I'm spending time with my mother-in-law or doing something like that or this. And I would, my, you know, I can see the tension building, you know, and you know, sometimes she would, you know, talk about things which I will not like and this and that. And, but then now I've started practicing to kind of, stay back a little bit okay it's okay not to go to the gym relax you don't have to get so agitated so for me it has i try to do it differently because i have done that enough 
maybe this will change too but yeah so i think that also we all evolve right we all evolve devolve whatever you know up and down up and down but it's for me that's the thing i always think that my whole anything that brings a lot of this thing that i have to really express my truth you know and sometimes we get really this thing how dare somebody tells me otherwise this is how i feel even like you know in um, even in friendships something you have to feel like okay i need to have a conversation with you or try to discord sometimes i don't now i used to really i used to be peace builder all the time you know i said okay you know figure out things sometimes i just don't figure out i said okay whatever it is other person got upset i don't know why that <laughs> i just used to speak to the mother i used to i'll tell her that you know maybe i messed up so can you please fix it for me because i don't know what to do because you know everything i have realized how limited are we in whatever right now in my consciousness i'm very limited so no matter what i'll do it will i'll screw up things in one way or the other you know i'll try to fix this maybe this will get okay but the other thing will get not okay and this and that and our whole life is like that if we look back so now i really don't want it and the only truth that i would really like to organize my life is that i should focus on my union with the divine in any way if you know whether it's in the mind or in the vital or you know in our human relationships so i think that's how i when when the discussions i was listening as well quite a lot everybody was saying and reflecting so yeah that's something i thought of sharing yeah thank you nandini so again putting things in context that what are we fighting for and you know if we read i don't know any master and mystic and maybe speaking about mother right now you know any time anybody ask her anything most of her answers are yeah you know like your ultimate goal like you said you know merging with the divine like finding the finding the divine or being the instrument of the divine so anything any truth any any end of everything is becoming one with the divine so if anything is coming in between that because the truth you no know, one truth of our existence is that we even curtail ourselves from the things we know should be there or we really want again for superficial harmonies a lot of time so probably realizing what is my priority choosing what is my truth and then walking towards it yeah and everybody's journey is different no right no wrong and how we keep changing from stage to stage and yeah mm. yeah charu ji do you have the capacity to unmute and share you had said you wanted to share something on this quote Okay, maybe she is not. That's not possible right now. Anything before we move on on whatever was discussed. I think uh, just a quick point. Um, uh, thanks, Nandini. You spoke so well, and um, I think that for me really sticks that this journey is about. ultimately uniting with the divine and all our activities should be focused with that in our mind and i think then everything else falls into place whether telling the truth or whether waiting for the right time to tell the truth and all of it so if you keep that as what you are walking towards i don't think there will ever be a doubt as to which way you need to go uh Uh, as far as the dishonesty or the falsity um uh, that is like the opposite of the truth uh this thing really came up for me uh because i spent such a long time in india i was with my sisters and with family and i think the the most dishonesty happens in these relationships uh which are the closest to you and uh what i realized is because we we had a lot of uh, discussions fights arguments and uh, heart to heart talks uh, this time because for about 20 years uh, uh we have this very difficult character in our uh, family uh, who everybody is uh, avoiding telling 
her um, about the issues everybody in the family faces with her. But nobody is ready to bell the cat. Nobody is ready to tell her on her face because they know there will be another drama. They're expecting another drama that will ensue. They, they know there'll be tears, there'll be accusations, there'll be allegations, and nobody wants to go through that. But as a result of that, of not being honest to tell her, listen, what you did was is not sitting well, or that's really selfish, or that's very hurtful. We, maybe five or six members of the family are going through loops and hoops and dramas of dishonesty every time we meet her, every time we face her. So this is the ridiculous part. This has been going on for 20 years. And obviously, I'm not stating that this person is bad. But this person also realizes something, right? That we are being dishonest in our approach. We seem nice in front, but she knows there's a lot of things happening uh, the moment her back is turned, you know. So so there's no running away from these things. What I realized is when we finally bear the feelings and emotions, a lot of times things were our perception. A lot of times things were different from her perception. And without actually telling which, which group is right or wrong, we're not even delving into it. But a lot of heartache and a lot of pain could have been avoided had we told things when we were more saner, more in control of our emotions, and probably things could have been better and not come to this point today in life, had we broached things, and this is the important part, when you broach things with a good intention, with control of emotions, and with the intention of it improving the other person or the relationship. So I feel sometimes just keep this in mind that, you know, while you walk through all this to avoid the eggshells, um, you end up hurting yourself and the other person a lot. So truth at the right time, uh, in the right way is a very important thing. Yes, thank you. Like first we wait so long because it would hurt somebody and then we explode, right? And the other person is at times also even shocked at where did this come from? So... Yeah, so the intention, right? Like we were talking about relative truths and is it needed? What would be the purpose of the truth? And yeah. Thank you, Deepa. So on special request, Jyotsna, Dee is here today with us and she has just joined in. So we are reflecting on, you know, the quote that was shared and really looking forward to your reflections, your thoughts on it. Thank you for joining in. Hi, Taru. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll listen a bit, then I'll I'll get into it. Okay, we have all basically, you know, shared our uh, take on this quote, uh, Jyotnadi, that we had shared, that if the truth shall kill them, let them die. And then, uh -huh. you know, how we discussed, we briefly mentioned yesterday that am I also ready to die, right? Like, if the truth shall kill me, am I ready for it? So what does it mean for us? So we spoke about, you know, various aspects that what is truth? Because, you know, usually our truths are relative. And sometimes we have seen that not seeing facts, right? Like say somebody's hurt, somebody's dying. We don't tell them that it would be too much. Like, is it bad? Is it wrong? So that those are the aspects that we were just reflecting on. No answers and no questions also really, but just trying to rattle the brains that may have, are we not seeing something which we could see or is it okay, we know it all. So, so if the truth shall kill them, let them die. Can we be so ruthless? Can we be so clear? Is it okay? What about compassion? What about morality? What about being pleasant? So anything that you would want to share on this. What your thoughts were when you probably, and you might have seen this before, it's a very popular one. So, yeah. Actually, um, being a devotee of Mother and Sri Aurobindo, um, I'm, I think I would... Um, sort of, uh, I have always hedged more towards the truth. And um, 
I have learned over time, uh, having touched 65 now, that um, at that time, the truth may kill. But uh, if you step back, listen, uh, the truth makes you emerge far stronger because you look within and you try to, you know, it, it the truth triggers introspection always, whether we accept it or not. And like they always say, truth is better. But I would still go one step further and say it may be bitter, but it forces us. We know that we know the truth inside, but when we are confronted with the truth, definitely it makes us introspect and it makes us emerge as much better human beings where our characters are concerned, where our molding is concerned. And uh, it's just a matter of a person training himself or telling himself time and again that I think I if, if, if I fail to uh, face the truth, it is my weakness. I am unable to, uh, I haven't um, um, grown enough or I haven't um, learned enough or I'm not trained enough or I haven't accepted enough to be able to delve into the truth or accept it. So stepping back, listening, uh, does um, it just does change one's perspective. But to accept truth always is quite tough. Tough, training tough, tougher, and listening to it and executing it even worse. But um, I think it's a winner. Finally, truth is always a winner. And as we say in layman's words, truth has legs. Always. So... So it and it cannot change. So that way, that was my first reaction to it. Of course, I thought it was very familiar, but I didn't connect that Ayn Rand said it. But then quite a few of her quotes are really, really striking. I'd go ahead and I would listen to all of you. Today, having joined, I think after more than a year. Yeah, that's true. More than a year for sure. And we are almost at the end. We don't go beyond usually an hour. We are meeting after a long time. And very grateful for your reflection because I think talking about myself, I keep involving the others. You know, like when this quote came to me, first thing it was the other and it felt great. And then it came to me, okay, am I ready to die for the truth? Like there's a lot of movement. But what you shared was, it's about me, right? It's just about me that, okay, my truth. Am I ready to face it? Am I ready to like, what is, it's all about me. And while you were sharing, you know, I had read something really beautiful in synthesis of yoga. And it's actually open on my computer right now and I'll share it. And it kind of, you had touched that space that Sri Aurobindo had mentioned about how we receive things not in truth. And how if we work on that, maybe if I can improve my receptivity of truth, receptivity of truth, maybe I won't need to go into all these questions and reflections that killing or not killing is secondary. But am I receiving the truth is maybe more important. So I just, uh, anybody, if they want to first share anything on anything before I share and then we'll uh, end. Yeah, yeah, one last thing. Um... You know, yesterday I was listening to Alok Da and uh, he was talking about, you know, absolute truth, and, you know, relative truth. And he said that uh, truth is paradoxical, uh, you know, in the, in the way that it is, you know, in some cases it is truth. In some cases it is, again, not helping very much. And I, I just remembered... Uh, no, I was just looking for it and I remembered the story of Yudhishthir in, in Mahabharata, right? So Yudhishthir is the person who never lies. He's always about dharma and truth. And with, because of that, his chariot 
uh, I think it was uh, it was always leviating a few inches above the ground because of that's how they portray it. That's that's how they say it. So uh, we, you know, when uh, I think after a couple of weeks or so, when when uh, Dronacharya just kept killing Pandavas, and you know Krishna couldn't take it anymore, and he he you know he tells uh, he tells all the Pandavas that you know listen, tell Dronacharya that Ashwadhamma is dead. So then you know the, here he plays a trick that. Uh, he uh, asked Bhima to kill that uh, kill, kill an elephant named Ashwadhama. So Bhima kills Ashwadhama, and everybody says Ashwadhama is dead. And Dronacharya doesn't trust Bhima, so he walks up to Yudhishthir, asks him the same question because he knew that Yudhishthir doesn't lie. And Yudhishthir says, "Yes, Dronacharya ji, uh, Ashwadhama is dead." As soon as he says it. Krishna uh, blows into the conch, and he's and he blows it so loud that the 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 after after this, Yudhishthira also continues that Drona uh, Ashwadhamma, the elephant is dead. But by then, you, you know, you uh, Dronacharya couldn't hear it. So and again, his chariot falls down. That that's that's the first time his chariot touches the ground. It is said. So. From this, what I'm just taking is instead of again talking about myself only, instead of I standing and judging, I can call for the force and ask that okay, should should I like how will I attend here and how will I ad address the situation and and I think um, the divine I, I I I like mother knows better than me that is for sure. If I ask the mother to tell me what I have to tell, then she will, you know, she will help me. You know, through me, she will tell whatever the truth is, and I think that's um, a bit easier for me to live. Just on what you said, something I also wanted to say about you know exactly. I also feel that to really connect with the truth consciousness supramental consciousness is also called truth consciousness you know we of course need to call her but another thing that's really important i think it's in synthesis somewhere only where the or I, yeah exactly i think in synthesis somewhere vishav says that for grace to act one of the very important work that we need to do is to get rid of preferences so you know when you said that you know I, we need to call the mother and you know sometimes like i also feel that and when i'm really invested in something and things don't go right and you know there is this harmony and this and i could feel a lot of drama going on i just want to step back and call her but the problem is because no matter how much we say you do it till the time you're not ready to let go of the preferences it cannot the truth cannot, cannot we cannot hold it you know we cannot become an instrument so I think for me, as I also feel, what you said is the constant reminder, maybe if we take every day, that if we really want it, if the aspiration is there to hold the, the consciousness of truth, then we have to let go of preferences. That's the least. So I think that's also a very important practice as well of letting go. Because even because you were talking about Yudhishthir, one of the pitfalls of him is because he was not able to let go of preferences, the preferences of always saying the truth, even at the cost of dharma. That's why he was not chosen as an instrument. Otherwise, he was the one who should be chosen in, in terms of the good one. But Krish, Arjun was chosen because of the receptivity. And also, I think, when I read the Gita, the kind of ability to constantly work on himself. That if Krishna is saying it, okay, you know, and, and the aspiration to know more. And again, doing the work, again, doing the work. So I think, this letting go of preferences that this is what I think should have happened. And it's very hard. It's so hard. I think take lifetimes. But <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. So thank you for that. Yeah. Can I say something? I think it is here that our surrender comes into play. And how much are we really surrendered to listen to that little voice that speaks within us and whether 
in that moment of truth, temper, emotions, whatever it is, whether we have the calmness to surrender completely and the awareness to listen to that little boy, that is what nails it. And uh, most of the time at a human level or as we evolve, we that voice goes, we don't listen. We, we just want to respond, uh, you know, immediately without the surrender being totally complete. So I think by the time we reach the complete surrender or we attempt to reach it, uh, it's a long way off. Yeah, beautiful point. And that voice is there all the time guiding you. You know, even if you are, I don't know, walking on trails and taking the wrong bridge, that voice would be there. Are you taking the right bridge? But you're so busy talking or looking at the scenery that you don't pay attention. So it's amazing how constantly one has to be reminded that pay attention because that voice is really little and it would not fight back. It suggests and it's up to you to take it up or not. Yeah, thank you. So I'll quickly share this and then we should uh, end the session. And uh, I don't know if, I mean, it is beautiful. We should, we will reflect on this. So so this is of the, on the, cha the chapter is concentration. And Sri Aurobindo is talking about purity and concentration. The whole page is very beautiful, I mean, for the whole book is. But right now, what Josnadi was sharing, this part really stuck out for me. So, there's a message from, yeah, okay. So, if anybody, I mean, if they want to read, otherwise I can read. Yeah, I'll read. The fault of our nature is first an inert subjection to the impact of things as they come in upon the mind pell-mell without order of control and then a half as and then a half as a imperfect concentration managed fitfully irregularly with a more or less chance emphasis on this or on that object according as they happen to interest not the higher soul or the judging and discerning intellect but the restless leaping fickle easily tired easily distracted lower mind which is the chief uh, enemy of our progress Thank you. So basically, I forgot even this one, like they're talking about purity and concentration, that how important it is. And he says that they're opposites, you know, impurity and not able to concentrate. It's also true that their opposites are also closely connected. For we have seen that impurity is a, so this part, impure, what is impurity? So impurity is a confusion of dharma. So that's what we were discussing, truth, right? What is truth? A lax, mixed and mutually entangled action of the different parts of the being. Like my being only because it's so entangled. So this is the mixture and this confusion proceeds from an absence of right concentration of its knowledge on the energies in the embodied soul. And from here, you know what Jagan had read, that the fault of our nature is first an inert, unaware subjection to the impact of things. How are things affecting me? You know how Charuji in the beginning was talking about comfort. It's all about how, what does it mean for me? What am I giving up for this? How is it hard for me? Rather than what it's truly doing to me. We cannot see often the full picture. So the fault of our nature is first an inert subjection to the impact of things as they come in upon the mind, pell-mell, without order or control, and then a haphazard imperfect concentration managed fitfully, 
irregularly with a more or less chance emphasis on this or on that object according as they happen to interest, not the higher soul or the judging and discerning intellect, but the restless, leaping, fickle, easily tired, easily distracted lower mind, which is the chief enemy of a product. So any progress, so whenever, you know, we are sitting down for concentration, focus, you know, this restless, leaping, fickle, easily tired, easily distracted lower mind, we come across often and it has to be calmed down or sometimes it is, sometimes we are not able to. So in such condition, purity, the right working of the functions, the clear, unstrained and luminous order of the being is an impossibility. So the truth in this condition, in the condition which is my truth right now, is an impossibility. So, yeah, I'll share this in the group. Any, we, okay, uh, yeah, we are late today in ending. Any reflections before we now end the session? Okay, so we'll end it here and uh, thank you for joining in. And I also wanted to, you know, ask what time would work for whom, if the day is suitable, if the weekend was suitable or if the weekday is better. I'll just post it on the group and maybe then we can share it. So, yeah, ending the session here, thanking Grace, thanking the Divine the divine in me which questions, which wants to know, which wants to clear the way, which wants to simplify, which wants the truth. May it strengthen and strengthen and strengthen by her grace and her love and her faith, my faith. So sharing the merit, if any, accumulated through all my thoughts and actions with everybody. May everybody be at peace and with true joy. Thank you. Thank you, Taru.